Thank you so much for having me here. I'm uh, delighted and I'm really looking forward to your questions. So I'll be giving this talk using language um, for obvious reasons. Uh, I can. This is one of the things that we humans are so good at, right? I am making air vibrations with my mouth. So I'm making tones and puffs and hisses while exhaling. And those air vibrations are traveling to you. They're impinging on your eardrums. And then your brain is transforming those vibrations into thoughts, hopefully. Right. So that is an amazing process. That is a way that we humans are able to transplant thoughts between minds. I can cause you to think something you probably have never thought before, like um, uh, imagine uh, a waltzing jellyfish reciting the Fibonacci sequence backwards. So if everything has gone well in your life so far, you probably haven't had that thought before. Uh, and so um, I've just forced your mind to formulate that idea for the first time through this medium of language. Now, of course, languages, uh, human languages differ from one another in all kinds of ways. There's not just one language. There are 7,000 different languages, and they have different sounds, they have different words, uh, and they have different structures. Let me give you uh, an example. Uh, if you want to say something simple in English, like he drank the poison, uh, there are a couple of things you need to know to produce a, a complete statement. Uh, let's just look at the verb here, drink. As soon as we try to translate this into other languages, we're going to run into some problems. So uh, for example, uh, is this something that happened in the past? Well, in some languages, like in English, you change the verb depending on whether it's in the present or in the past, the time relative to now. But in lots of human languages, you don't change the verb at all. So whether it happened already or it's happening now or happened in the future isn't marked on the verb. And sometimes it's not marked in the sentence at all. Other languages require much more specificity than English. So for example, in Mian, this is a language spoken in Papua New Guinea, there are five different past tenses. So depending on how long, something, how long ago something occurred, you're going to use a different form of the verb. So it's within a week, within two weeks, within a month, and so on, different, different forms. Um, in some languages, you change the verb depending on whether the doer, the actor, is male or female. So for example, in Russian, my native language, you would use a different form of the verb uh, if it's uh, someone who's male doing the drinking. Um, here's an interesting one. Uh, why did the person drink the poison? Did they intend to do it? Did they know they were drinking poison? So take the example of Romeo of Romeo and Juliet. Romeo drank the poison. He knew he was drinking poison. He intended to drink the poison. He did what he intended to do. Right? Or take the example of Caesar. He drinks poisoned wine. Right? Now, he tends to drink the wine, so the, drink, the physical act of drinking is intentional, but it's unknowing that it's poison. He doesn't know that he's drinking poison. Or take the case of Socrates. He is being forced to drink uh, poison. Right? So he knows he's drinking, but he's doing it under duress. He's doing it unwillingly. Now, in, some, in English, it's perfectly fine to take all those three cases and say he drank the poison. So Socrates drank the poison, Romeo drank the poison, Caesar drank the poison. Same construction. But in some languages, you use different constructions for those three situations. So for example, in Devehi, this is a language spoken in the Maldives, you would necessarily distinguish those scenarios depending on whether the person intended to do it, whether they knew uh, what the outcome would be. Uh, another example, uh, how do you know this information? Right. So is this something that you witnessed with your own eyes? Is this something that you heard about from someone else? So in English, this isn't something we necessarily distinguish. But in other languages, like in Turkish or in Korean, you would change the construction depending on how you came to know about this information. So in Turkish, if it's something that you witness yourself, that's uh, one form of the verb. But if it's something you heard about, then it's a different form of the verb. Now, when people have looked at these kinds of differences between languages, one first interpretation has been, well, of course, speakers of different languages have to think differently because, look, uh, their languages are requiring them to encode such different types of information and make such different distinctions. On the other hand, people have argued, you yeah, know, not so fast. Just because people talk differently doesn't mean they think differently, right? So whenever you say anything, whenever you put anything in language, you're reporting actually only a tiny proportion of what you actually know about the situation. Right, so if I say to you, it's raining, it rained this morning, 
I don't have to say, oh, but not inside this room, only outside, right? You didn't think, oh, but Lara doesn't know uh, that it only rains outside and not actually inside the Regency C ballroom. Um, and so it could be that, in fact, speakers of all languages know all of these different things, all of these different facts about what they witness and observe. And it just so happens that they, by virtue of their languages, they choose to put different things in, uh, in their utterances. But they've noticed the same things, they pay attention to the same things, they remember the same things. Logically, that would have to mean that speakers of all the world's languages pay attention to and encode all of the distinctions that are encoded in all of the world's languages. So that is a potentially really large number of things to pay attention to and encode. And we've learned over the last 50 years of cognitive psychology that humans are actually extremely limited in their attention and their ability to remember things, right? So this is where the tension in this field comes from. Is it really the case that languages guide what we attend to, how we think, how we reason? Or do we fundamentally all think the same way and just happen to talk differently? Now, this is a really old question, right? So people have been offering strong opinions on this topic for a really long time. So here's Charlemagne, Holy Roman Emperor. He says, to have a second language is to have a second soul. Charles V uh, says, uh, a man who knows four languages is worth four men. A very strong statement about the worth of a language. Um, Frederick the Great of Prussia, one of their successors, had a more specific set of hypotheses. He said, I speak English to my accountants, French to my ambassadors, Italian to my mistress, Latin to my god, and German to my horse. Uh, not really clear how he came up with this particular set of assignations. But this is the kind of thing you've heard before, right? So all of us have heard that this language is great for romance, and this other language is great for argument, or for reason, or for whatever. And uh, none of the kinds of things that you've heard like that actually have any empirical basis, right? They're all just made up things. It's not impossible that some of those things could potentially be shown to be true. They just have never uh, been investigated. So bad news is I can't tell you what language to learn to become a, a great reasoner or a great lover. Uh, there's uh, more research to be done there. But um, this question of whether language shapes thought actually uh, has been extremely controversial in the field of cognitive science and for a few decades actually was taboo. Um, so here's Jerry Fodor, he's a philosopher of mine, and he is articulating a, a pretty standard view of this question uh, through the 70s and 80s in cognitive science. He says, I hate relativism more than I hate anything else, excepting maybe fiberglass power boats. Right, so. He likes to go sailing, that's why he doesn't like fiberglass power boats. But other than that, the bane of his existence is this idea that the languages we speak shape the way we think. Now, for a long time, people argued about this question back and forth, had a lot of interesting a priori arguments, but there was very little data, very, very little empirical work done on the question until recently. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you uh, some of my favorite examples from um, empirical work done over the last 20 years or so on the fundamentals of uh, the mind. So how we think about space, time, number, causality, these kinds of things. So uh, let's start with time. Uh, the word time is actually the most frequent noun uh, in English. Uh, and other temporal words like year and day are also in the top 10. And this is true in a lot of European languages that words like time and temporal words are very, very frequent. We're obsessed with time. One reason, of course, is that we have many different uses for the word time in English. Um, so how do we conceptualize this, uh, this fundamental domain? Well, uh, one thing people noticed early on is that time seems to flow in uh, the direction that we're used to reading and writing. So the simple artifact of reading and writing in your language can shape the direction in which you believe time goes. Uh, here's a, a little anecdote from advertising. This is uh, from a Nestle product that is a nutritional supplement for kids. And so uh, if you read this logo uh, the way you would be inclined to from left to right in English, um, you can see uh, why this product would be beneficial for your child. When they started marketing this in Arabic-speaking countries, uh, Arabic is written from right to left, they ran into a problem because if you read this graphic from right to left, it's quite puzzling what this product does for your child. 
And in fact, when you ask uh, speakers of different languages to arrange temporal sequences, so you give them a stack of cards that have some uh, temporal sequence inherent in them, and you say, uh, arrange these so that they uh, are in the correct order, English speakers will almost always do it from left to right, and then speakers of Arabic and Hebrew are more likely to do it from right to left. Okay, so that's one, uh, one feature, just the way a language is written can shape the direction of time. Uh, another question is about uh, whether, where the future goes. So for a long time, uh, people thought, well, the future has to be in front. Right. So in English, of course, these are the metaphors we have. The best is ahead of us, the worst is behind us. Uh, we put the future in front, the past behind. And all kinds of arguments were made about why this had to be the case. So people would say, of course, we have eyes on the front of our bodies, not the back of our heads. We walk forwards, not backwards mostly. So biologically, maybe it's necessary that the future is in front. Well, it turns out that there are places around the world where uh, the future is behind. So for example, for the IMR, this is a language spoken in South America. Uh, their metaphors put the past in front, the future behind. And when you look at the way they move their bodies, the way they gesture as they're talking about time, uh, it also bears out this metaphor. So for example, the IMR might say, oh, that was a long time ago. Whereas in English, of course, it's like, that was a long time ago. And the reason it makes sense for them, that people always ask, why, why would that make sense? Well, because the past is manifest. You know what happened. You can see it. Uh, the future is unknown, so it's behind. Time doesn't have to just be in the horizontal plane. So there's a dominant a vertical metaphor in Mandarin, for example, where the past is up and the future is down, and in all kinds of uh, implicit psychological tests and observing gestures, you can see that Mandarin speakers actually have this lively vertical representation of time, where English speakers uh, have either a weaker one or don't have one. Now, time also doesn't have to go just with respect to the body. So, so far, I told you about left to right, right to left, right to back. Uh, but that's not the only way that time can go. And um, this is research with a community uh, in Australia that I had a chance to work with. Uh, these are the Kupt Hire. They live in a small community on Cape York, on the west coast of Cape York. Um, and what's cool about languages like the Kupt Hire is they don't use words like left and right to divide up space. And instead, everything goes into cardinal directions, so like north, south, east, and west. Um, and when I mean everything, when I say everything, I really mean everything. So you say things like, there's an ant on your southwest leg, or move your cup to the north-northeast a little bit. Uh, the boy standing uh, to the south of Mary is my brother, right? So at every scale, you're putting things in cardinal directions. In fact, even the way that you say hello in Kuktaiar, so in English we say, how are you? Fine. In Kuktaiar you say, which way are you going? And the answer should be something like, North, northeast, in the far distance. How about you? Right. So imagine yourself as you're navigating this conference. Every time you say hi to someone, you have to report your heading direction. Okay. Now, that would get you oriented really quickly because you literally couldn't get past hello. You couldn't enter into the most basic social interaction without knowing which way you're facing. And uh, let's just do a quick test here. I am a psychologist. So uh, close your eyes. Everyone close your eyes. Uh, and point southeast. No cheating. Okay, you can open your eyes. So I see points there, 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 there. I think you've got all the directions. Uh, excellent. So I have no idea which way it is myself. Um, but I'll say that it wasn't very helpful to ask you guys. Um, let me make a couple of observations. Uh, the first thing that happened when I asked you to point southeast is that you guys laughed. And I think that's not because you thought, oh, what a trivially easy question. Why does she insult us with such an easy question? But you just thought, oh, how am I supposed to know that? It was surprising to be asked something like that. You didn't expect that. Um, the other is that those of you, I mean, some of you didn't point at all. So the compliance rate in this room, you know, <laughs> just saying. But, uh, those of you who did point, you didn't point right away. It took you a second, and I could almost see you doing mental rotation in your mind. You were thinking, okay, where is the water? Where, where is the hotel? How did I enter into this room? How, and you were just kind of doing this mental rotation in your mind. I could see the wheels turning. Right. So it wasn't something automatic. If I asked you point left or point up, you wouldn't have to do that kind of work, right? It would, it would be much more available to you. And then there's the small issue of accuracy, but we don't have to. So, um, 
So there's some places in the world where you can ask people, point southeast. I can ask a five-year-old, can you point southeast? And they'll do that without hesitation. They'll be correct. Right? So speaking a language that requires you to encode uh, cardinal directions uh, makes you really good at staying oriented and actually allows people to navigate in ways that we used to think humans couldn't. So there's this whole field of research into path integration or dead reckoning where we knew that ants could do it and salmon could do it and all, all these other birds could do it. We always had some excuse for why humans couldn't do it. Like we don't have magnets in our beaks or you know, we can't detect the light of uh, the angle of incident light from celestial bodies on our back scales, things like that. It turns out that if humans just pay attention to which way is which and continuously update that information, they can dead reckon and path integrate uh, just like these other creatures. Okay, so we're talking, uh, coming back to talking about time, these folks don't use words like left and right. They instead lay everything out in uh, cardinal direction space. So how do they lay out time? So here's a set of pictures that I took to the Cook Tire. These happen to be pictures of my grandfather at different ages. And I would take these pictures, I would scramble them up, give them to you in a stack and say, lay these out so that they're in the correct order. And let me show you a little bit of data. So uh, here's one person. Uh, they're sitting facing east. And these are a bunch of different cards that they've laid out. And you can see all of these go from left to right. Here's the same person on a different day. Now they're sitting facing north. And uh, uh, now they've laid everything out from right to left. Different person. Now they're facing east. And now they've laid everything out coming towards them. What's the pattern? I hear people whispering east to west, right? So time in, in this uh, group goes from east to west. And of course, one way of describing the data is to say, oh, how weird. They make time go in different directions with respect to their bodies, depending on which way they're facing. But another way of describing the data is to say, oh, cool. Actually, time for them always goes in the same direction, right? And it's us. So if I'm facing this way, then time goes this way. And I'm facing this way, time goes this way very egocentric of me to make the dimension of time chase me around every time I turn my body. For them, time is locked to the landscape. Um, now, there are lots of actually other ways that time flows along the landscape in different cultures. East to west is not the only way. Here's my favorite way. This is from the work of Rafael Nunez. Um, the Yugno of Papua New Guinea have time roll into the village at one angle. Then once it hits the village, it takes a turn and rolls out at a different angle. Uh, and this has to do with the location of the mouth and the source of the Yugno River. These are important locations for them. Uh, and so time follows the crow's path to those two important locations from the village. So time doesn't even have to go in a straight line. It can follow the local topography and make a bent line. Okay. Now, I've given you all of these examples of how people in different places think differently about time. But how do we know that language is causal? How do we know that language is really creating these differences? Because lots of things could create differences between groups, right? There could be differences in their physical environment, differences in other cultural practices outside of language. Um, so how do we know language actually can make these kinds of differences? Well, I'm an experimental psychologist. And so what I like to do is bring people into the lab and change, you know, turn the dial that I'm interested in uh, and then see if that has an effect on the outcome, right? So I bring people into the lab. And I teach them to talk one way or to talk another way. So I teach them a little mini language. I, for example, I might bring English speakers into the lab and teach them Mandarin-like metaphors for time, vertical metaphors, where either we put the past above or the past below. And they get a little, just a tiny bit of training using these new metaphors. And then we test them in all of these implicit cognitive tasks where they have, we have them press buttons as quickly as possible. And we try to measure their implicit spatial biases. And what we find is that if you teach people new metaphors for time, that changes the way they think. Right? You teach people to talk differently, they uh, acquire new ways of thinking, and they start thinking differently. And what's interesting here is that teaching people to talk differently isn't something that just sticks around in their linguistic system. When people are uh, told Monday is above Tuesday, Tuesday is above Wednesday, what they start to do is they start to imagine a spatial layout, a vertical spatial layout. It becomes a visual representation for them. So once they've learned that, you can disrupt their linguistic system all you want. You can give them all kinds of verbal interference tasks. But that vertical representation that they've learned sticks around. Right? So you haven't just taught them uh, a new linguistic routine. You've actually taught, taught them a new set of images 
that they can then use productively even when they don't have access to language. Okay, let me give you another example. This is from the domain of color. Uh, so languages divide up the color spectrum really differently. Some languages have lots of words for colors. Some languages don't have a word that specify colors per se. Some languages have only a couple of words for colors, light and dark. And where languages put boundaries between colors differs from language to language. So here's an example uh, of a difference between Russian and English. So in English, all of the colors there can be called blue. Uh, whereas in Russian, there's not a single word that covers all blues. Russians necessarily must distinguish between light blues and dark blues. So there's a light blue term, boy, and a dark blue term, seen. So if you're a Russian speaker, then you have a lifetime of experience of making a distinction uh, within the blue range that English speakers don't have. And the question is, does that actually translate into differences in performance? So we can measure, give people a really simple task where they have to discriminate shades of blue, measure how quickly or how accurately they can do it, and what we find is that Russian speakers are faster to discriminate colors that go across the boundary in Russian uh, and slower that are within uh, categories in, in Russian. And English speakers don't have that kind of discontinuity within the blue range. Right? So they, there's, no, there's no psychological boundary there for them. And these are the kinds of differences you can actually start seeing very early on in brain processing. So um, Greek makes a similar distinction to Russian. And when uh, researchers have tested Greek speakers, as they're looking at uh, different shades of blue, for example, if you cross the boundary, if you're showing different shades of blue and you cross that boundary from light to dark, the brain gives this really fast surprise signal that says, oh, something categorically has changed. If you show the same pattern to English speakers, there's no surprise signal. English brain, the English speaker's brain doesn't detect that something categorically has changed. Here's another uh, feature of human languages, quite odd. Uh, human languages, many of them, have grammatical gender. So who here speaks a language with grammatical gender, like Spanish, German, Greek? So you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, grammatical genders differ across uh, languages. So for example, the sun is feminine in German, masculine in Spanish, the moon is, re is the reverse. There, it seems to be largely arbitrary, not entirely arbitrary, but largely arbitrary, the correlation outside of the class of animals, even across just Indo-European languages, is very close to zero, slight positive, but very close to zero. So speakers of these languages, of course, have to learn these genders. Do people take these genders as meaningful? Do they actually think that the moon is somehow more masculine if they speak German or somehow more feminine if they speak Spanish? Now, uh, just to give you a sense of how pervasive grammatical gender is in natural languages, uh, here's an example from Russian. In Russian, words of different gender have uh, different sounds, different phonology. They have, you use different number words with them, different adjective endings, different pronouns and possessives, and even different verb endings. So if you just look at that example I've uh, circled in red, uh, that says, my chair was white. The word chair is masculine in Russian. So you have to use the masculine form of my. Then you have uh, the word chair, which is a masculine sounding ending. Um, then you have the word, uh, the masculine form of was, and then you have the masculine form of white. So you have just marked the masculinity of a chair four times in four words, right? There's a lot of dependency here that's built into the language. And it doesn't actually just stay within the sentence. If you go on to talk about the chair later and you refer to it as it, you still have to keep track of the fact that it's a masculine thing, right? Um, so, what effect could this possibly have on how people think? Like, what would it actually mean to think of an object as masculine or feminine? Uh, obviously, there, you know, if you think the podium might be masculine or feminine, you don't suppose that it has parts underneath that you might be able to distinguish. Uh, so what would it actually mean? So uh, here's an example from uh, a novel. This is uh, Andre Makin, and he's writing memoirs of a Russian boy who's learning French from his grandmother. Uh, and he's looking at a flower, either seeing it through Russian eyes or through French eyes. And the, the word flower is different genders in the two languages. So he says, as a child, I absorbed all the, um, uh, all the sounds of Charlotte's language, French. I swam in them without wondering why that glint in the grass, that um, colored, scented, living brilliance sometimes existed in the masculine and had a crunchy, fragile, crystalline identity imposed, it seemed, by one of its names, 
tsvitok, that's the Russian word for flower, and it's masculine, it was sometimes enveloped in a velvety felt-like and uh, feminine aura, becoming a fleur, which is French for flower and feminine. So he's giving you here a sense of what it would mean to see the same object as masculine or feminine. But of course, you could ask reasonably, is this something that only happens to sensitive Russian boys learning French from their grandmothers, or is this something that happens to average folks? Um, and so there's been a lot of research on this. Uh, for example, um, it's a very popular uh, when, you, when you want to avoid someone guessing what you might be doing in an experiment, it's very popular to test kids because you know, they're not thinking of themselves as experimental subjects and what condition they're in. So in a lot of studies, uh, researchers have approached kids and said, we need your help uh, making an animated movie. Uh, we need to give voices to these characters. Can you tell us what voice to give to this toaster or to this fox or to this arrow or alarm clock and so on? And what they find is that kids very early on, if they're uh, Spanish learning or French learning, will start assigning voices that are consistent with grammatical gender in their language. Uh, you also see this when you just ask people to describe objects. So uh, you take a German speaker and a Spanish speaker, Take a word like bridge, for example, which is opposite grammatical genders in the two languages, and you say, describe a bridge to me. Give me three adjectives that describe bridge, the first three adjectives that come to mind. And what you find is that on the aggregate, people come up with really different adjectives depending on the grammatical gender of the noun. So for bridge, uh, if it's masculine in your language, you might say that bridges are long, strong, towering. If it's feminine in your language, you might be more likely to say that bridges are long. Uh, are beautiful or elegant, uh, things like that. Now, of course, bridges are all of these things. It's just which things are coming to mind as uh, the, first, the first central features, is the question. Uh, and this is actually an effect that you can observe even with your own eyes. So you can ask, for example, when a, a sculptor or painter has to personify some abstract entity in art. So I'm going to paint death or I'm going to paint time. How do I decide uh, if it's going to be a, a male figure or a female figure? Uh, we did an analysis of ArtStore. This is a really big uh, database with millions of images. Um, and we looked at all of the personifications and allegories in ArtStore. And what we found was that 78% of the time, you could predict the gender of the personification from the gender of the noun in the artist's native language. And this surprised me because you know artists are supposed to be such iconoclasts, at least in modern, uh, modern conception, right? But here they are enslaved by a little quirk of grammar, right? So if the word time is masculine in your language, you're going to paint it as a man. Um, so uh, here are just some examples. This is from the Medici, the Medici Chapel uh, in Florence. And these are different times of day. So you have the feminine dawn, the masculine day, the masculine dusk, the feminine night. And these are, of course, all consistent with grammatical gender. Now, languages also are necessary for us to understand, construe, interpret events. And even really simple events um, require construal. Even, I'll say something that sounds paradoxical. Even simple events are complicated. Right? They require construal. So here's an example of a simple event that's quite complicated. So a few years ago, Dick Cheney goes out hunting with his buddy, Harry Whittington. Uh, Whittington happens to be a lawyer, and Cheney uh, shoots uh, Whittington accidentally uh, in the face. So this is the way that uh, the European Herald described the event. They said, Cheney bags lawyer. Obviously, this is meant to be funny, as if Cheney went out hunting for lawyers and he got one. Good for him. Now, canonically, you could say in English, uh, Cheney shot Whittington. Uh, you could say Whittington got shot by Cheney, removing Cheney out of it a little bit. You could leave Cheney out altogether. So you just say Whittington got shot. Um, you can make it more colorful. So the Texas newspapers had uh, headlines like, Whittington got peppered pretty good. Uh, so <laughs> focusing on the manner. Um, here's what Cheney said uh, when he was giving an interview about this. This is when he was, um, quote, uh, taking full responsibility for the event. Uh, he said, well, ultimately, I'm the guy who pulled the trigger that fired the round that hit Harry. And you can talk about all the other conditions that existed at the time, but that's the bottom line. And no, it was not Harry's fault. So that's nice of him. Uh, <laughs> not my friend's fault. I shot him in the face. But look at that first sentence. Ultimately, I'm the guy who pulled the trigger that
that fired the round and that hit Harry. Right, so we're taking, it doesn't take a long time to shoot your friend in the face, right? It's a split second physical event. Just to be clear, it's a simple event. It's not like the collapse of the global economy or global warming where you have lots of causal agents acting over uh, complex periods of time, right? This is a simple event, but he's chained it out and made it uh, a whole series of events and he just happens to be on one end of that long series of events. And this is something language allows us to do whenever we choose a verb, we're taking a perspective on how much time we're going to compress into an event, right? So I can say we built Rome or we cured polio. Uh, a single verb can cover all of that effort and all of those sub-events and all of that time. Or we can use four verbs to say I shot my friend in the face. That's, that's fine too. Um, Bush actually did one better. He said uh, he heard a bird flush and he turned and pulled the trigger and saw his friend get wounded. Now, that, that is a masterful exculpation. Uh, so here, Cheney transforms from agent to mere witness by the end of the sentence. And again, uh, natural languages allow us to do this, right? You can drastically shift the role of a person, even within a sentence. Of course, The Onion always has the best headlines. They had White, White House had prior knowledge of Cheney threat. August briefing warned Cheney determined to shoot old man in the face. Now, the reason I tell you these, uh, these examples, of course, some of them are meant to be funny, is just to showcase how much uh, language can be used to construe uh, even a really simple event, how much leverage we have to chain it out into lots of events, put the focus or the agency one place or another. Um, and languages also differ in the ways that they normally parse up events and the kinds of information they normally package together. And so the question becomes, does that change what we remember, what we attend to as we're going around our world. Now just to remind you, um, uh, some people believe that their memory is perfect and they can uh, really remember everything very well. So let me just uh, try to convince you that's not the case. So uh, imagine an American penny, probably something that you've seen thousands of times in your life. Um, now I'm not going to ask you to actually draw one, but try to imagine it well enough that you could draw it. Now, uh, some of you may be having problems. This is uh, what happens if you ask undergraduates to draw pennies. These are the kinds of drawings you get. And you see that they're really quite different from one another, right? So what words are available, where things are, which way the picture is facing, what the picture is of, all of those are different. And you could imagine saying, well, people are just aren't very good at drawing. Maybe it's a translation problem. I can imagine the penny just fine in my mind. I just can't put it on paper. And so, um, of course, then I could say, all right, well, if you know Penny so well, something you've seen thousands of times, uh, why don't you pick out the correct Penny? Which one of them is the real U.S. Penny? Any enthusiasts here who know? <laughs> Imperialism, sorry. So it's that one. Uh, it's traveling over there. But just to point out, you know, of course, this is an object you've seen thousands of times. Many of you probably have one in your pocket, and yet your brain has not encoded the kind of detail to be able to make this discrimination. And thank God, I mean, you don't need to remember all the details that you encounter in the world. Your brain has made a really good decision. But of course, your, make, your brain is making these decisions all the time. What are you going to encode? What are you uh, going to completely discard despite seeing something thousands and thousands of times? So uh, here's the difference between languages and uh, how they encode events. In English, whether something is intentional or accidental doesn't matter so much for how we talk. So in both cases here, you could say Pat broke the vase. Um, lots of languages make a much stronger distinction. So for example, in English, you can even say, I broke my arm. Uh, now, in lots of languages, you could only use that construction if you're a lunatic and you went out looking to break your arm and you succeeded. Right. Otherwise, you would have to say something else, like, it so happened that my arm got broken, or my, ar my arm broke, something like that. And so uh, here I'm showing an example from Spanish. In Spanish, there's a stronger distinction made between intentional actions and accidents, where if it's intentional, you say, Pat broke the vase. But if it's an accident, then you might say something like, the vase broke, or the vase broke itself. Or maybe, to me, it so happened that the vase broke. But you're not the agent uh, of breaking the vase, and often you're not even mentioned. Uh, the person is not even mentioned. So this makes two predictions. Um, 
One is that maybe English speakers wouldn't be as attentive to whether something was intentional or accidental because it's not something they necessarily have to distinguish in language. And the other is that maybe English speakers would be more attentive to who did it because they're always talking about who did it. They're always putting it agentively. Even if it's an accident, you're still saying Pat broke the vase. Whereas in uh, other languages like in Spanish or Japanese, you would leave out the agent and not talk about them as doing something. Um, so here's uh, a really simple experiment that we did. Uh, we show people little videos. This is an intentional action. A man aggresses against a balloon. Here's a, an accidental counterpart. No, oh, come on. There you go. All right. So people watch one or the other of those videos, and there's a whole series of videos of different crimes against balloons and pencils and so on. Um, and it's one of two guys that is always seen doing it, either a guy in a blue shirt or a guy in a yellow shirt. Um, so you've seen half the actions done by one guy, half the actions done by the other guy. And then we do a police lineup. We say, remember that thing with the balloon? Which one of those two guys on the bottom did it? So kind of like a lineup, an eyewitness memory lineup. Who's, who's the balloon perpetrator? So when you ask this question, uh, we have asked it to speakers of different languages, English, Spanish, Japanese. If it was an intentional action, if the guy intentionally pricked the balloon, uh, everyone remembers well who did it. Right? There's, there are no differences across languages. However, if it's an accident, then it's the English speakers who remember well who did it. And speakers of languages that wouldn't say he popped the balloon, instead would say the balloon popped when it's an accident. They don't remember as well who did it. But if you change the question, so this is a word by Luna Filipovich, she turned our experiment upside down and she said, what if instead of asking who did it, you ask, do you remember if it was an accident? Well, now it's the English speakers who don't remember as well, where speakers of Spanish remember better. So you have speakers of different languages have witnessed the same event, the same crime against a balloon, but they come away remembering different things. One group remembers who did it better, the other group remembers the intention better. Right? And this is uh, aligned with what's uh, required in the languages. Of course, you could ask, how do you know that language is causal? Can language really push you around? Uh, it could be that there are some other differences, underlying differences between English and Spanish and Japanese speakers that lead to these. And so, again, in the lab, we like to bring people in and push around exactly the predictor that uh, we're interested in and see if it really makes a difference. So, for example, we bring English speakers in and we expose them either to a lot of agentive language or a lot of non-agentive language. So we either say, uh, agentively, she blew out the match, uh, she burned the toast, or we say, the match blew out, the toast burned. So they hear a lot of these sentences of one form or the other. Uh, and then we show them these same videos that are unrelated, different actions, um, and again, ask them who did it the first time. And what we find is that the English speakers have just been hearing the match blew out, the necklace unfastened, the paint splattered, all of these non-agentive sentences. They remember less well who did these other unrelated events. Right? So they start paying attention to something else. Less attention to who did it and more attention to other things. Um, now another question you could ask is whether this matters for blame and punishment. Right? So not just for what you remember about events, but whether or not you blame and punish the people involved. Now, one possibility is that um, you know, if you are witnessing an event, you make your judgments about blame and punishment based on um, some kind of moral criteria that are completely independent, uh, physical or moral criteria that are independent of language. Right? So language might have no effect. Another possibility is language have some, has some kind of medium strength effect. So maybe if you don't know very much about the event or you didn't see it with your own eyes, then language could influence uh, your ideas about blame and punishment, but otherwise not. Or another possibility, possibility is that language could have a strong effect. So even if you can see it with your own eyes, you can watch it over and over again, even if it's something you know a lot about, uh, even then, the way that it's described could influence your view of blame and punishment. So we needed a really famous accident. And at the time that we started this work, the most famous accident was this original wardrobe malfunction that uh, happened with Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake. Um, this. Uh, was a, a huge uproar uh, at the Super Bowl. They performed the halftime show. And in the last dance move, uh, Timberlake reached across Janet Jackson's chest. And then for 9 16ths of a second, her partially exposed breast was on television. 
and this was the news of the day for about a month. Uh, people were so uh, repulsed and uh, shocked that um, it became uh, the most TiVoed event, the most TiVoed several seconds in TiVo history. Uh, people rewound it over and over again just to continue being outraged. Um, uh, the FCC uh, tried to fine CBS $550,000 for this event. So this is a, a really talked about event. So we, we needed a famous accident. We had one. So all of our participants had seen this. Many of them had seen it many, many times. And of course, we could also show them the video again so they could re-examine it uh, for themselves. Um, and we, we asked, would describing it a gently or not a gently make a difference for how much they wanted to blame and punish Justin Timberlake in this case. So we gave them a report that said uh, they were performing a halftime show, blah, 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 and then in his final dance move, he unfastened his snap, tore apart the bodice, he slipped the cover right off Jackson's uh, chest. And the parts that are in red are the only parts that changed for the non agenda report. So uh, it's all the same except it says in the final dance move, a snap unfastened part of the bodice tore, the cover slid right off Jackson's chest. And so we asked people a bunch of questions, including how much is Timberlake to blame? And here I'm showing you data um, when people get only a description, don't watch the video. When they get the description first, then watch the video. When they get the video first, then watch the description, and so on. And it doesn't actually matter what you do here. People always blame Timberlake more if they got the agentive language than if they got the non-agentive language. We also asked them, how much of this $550,000 should Timberlake have to pay? Uh, and again, uh, they want to charge him more. In fact, they want to charge him 53% more uh, if, it's, uh, if they hear the agenda report. Now, what's striking to me about this is we often think of witnessing something with our own eyes as the way to j decide what really happened and what's right, right? So we say, let's go to the tape. Right? So you could go and review the tape, and then you'll know exactly what happened. And here, we've given people ample opportunity to review the tape. They can watch it over and over again. But it's not the tape that's causing them to make this distinction. Right? The way that it's being described for them makes a big difference. So that suggests that language is a strong influence, even if it's something you can see with your own eyes multiple times and something you've talked a lot about with other people before. Still, framing it one way or another in the moment can make a big difference. OK, fun part. Languages also differ um, in how they uh, do numbers. So um, of course, we're used to the decimal system in English. Um, some languages use a base 20 system. Uh, some languages use a base 5 system. Those are the most common. 10, 5, 20 are the most common for obvious reasons. Um, but there are other body-based systems. So for example, this is from uh, a language spoken in Papua New Guinea, that's a body-based system, a base 27 system, so it's shown here. Uh, and the body part turns are actually the number words, so you have eight potatoes would be elbow potatoes, for example. Uh, some languages have uh, binary systems, so they only have words for uh, one and two, and then you have to use, reuse those words to say larger numbers, which is very cumbersome. Um, and then there's some languages that don't have number words at all don't have precise number words at all. So there's no way to actually say seven in a language like the Piraha. So here I'm showing the Piraha man. This is a language spoken in the Amazon. And what researchers have asked is, if you don't have exact number words in your language, are you actually able to keep track of exact numbers? Because the way that we're taught in Western culture to keep track of exact quantities is to count. This is a little trick, a little routine that we've uh, taught ourselves. So if you show me an array of a bunch of dots and you ask how many, if it's more than three or four, I might start implementing this routine. And it goes like this. I'm going to name the first one one, and then the next one two, and then go three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, eight. And once I've named all of the dots, the last word that I said in the count sequence is the number in there. Right? That's a routine, a simple routine that humans in the West are taught to implement. And so um, if you're given this task, for example, a researcher lays out a number of spools of thread and then gives you a pile of balloons and say, give me the same, make it the same, you would count. You would use the, uh, the count routine, and then you would lay out the balloons. And if you had to check, you would re-implement the routine. And you would say, OK, let me check. And you'd go through and count. Um, but Piraha can't do that. They don't have exact number words. And in fact, they're quite satisfied to do this approximately. So they don't, they don't um, know that they're doing something wrong, that they're not getting it right. And 
what you see is the amount of error uh, as people do this task increases proportionally to the number that they have to estimate or uh, recreate. It suggests that what they're doing is approximating rather than keeping track of exact numbers. Now, um, how do we know language is really causal for this? How do we know people really use a verbal routine to do this, say, uh, Western American English speakers? Well, one way is to try to limit people's ability to use language as they're doing this. So you take MIT students, for example, MIT undergraduates. Normally, they're able to count under normal circumstances. Um, but you uh, give them a hard verbal task to do. So they have to, for example, you play them BBC News reports and they have to shadow. They have to repeat everything that they hear. And so while they're shadowing these news reports, you put up sets of dots on the screen and they have to say how many there are. And what you see is that these MIT students, normally uh, able to count, uh, their performance falls apart and they start to show this uh, really signature noise function that suggests they're approximating rather than being able to tell what the exact number is. And that's exactly what you get with you know, rats, with infants, what you get with folks who don't have number words, is that you have to default to an uh, approximation system. You can't actually keep track of exact numbers. Now, of course, it's a huge problem when your two comparison groups are hunter-gatherers in the Amazon and MIT undergraduates. Uh, and you're testing them on some mathematical task, right? Uh, there are going to be a lot of reasons for why one group might do better than another. And so, uh, for one thing, you want to know, what if you live in a culture that is numerate, that does use number, but you just don't have access to uh, the language of number, right? So how could that be, that you live in a culture that's numerate, but you don't have number words? Well, one reason that occurs is if someone is born deaf and isn't exposed to formal deaf education. So there's been research done on um, home signers in Nicaragua. So these are individuals who are congenitally deaf. They grow up in families that don't live near, uh, near a place where they can go to a deaf school. And so they never get exposed to a structured sign language. And so they never get exposed to this idea of exact numbers in language. And what's remarkable about these individuals is they live in a highly numerate society. So I'm showing you a street scene from their normal environment. You know, they ride buses, they use money, they, uh, they gamble, they, they're married to spouses who are hearing and use number. Uh, but they themselves, when you ask them to do these simple number tasks, recreate small exact numbers, they can't do it. They can't do it precisely. And they're very frustrated. They know they're missing something. They're frustrated with themselves uh, about the fact that they can't do it. They know, for example, that when they go to the store and they give a certain amount of money to someone, that person somehow knows how much money to give them back, and they just have no idea how that's done. They don't have any entry into this number system. Language is not the only way to do it, but it is one, one of the most popular ways around the world. Right? It's a system that once you build, build those number words into, into your language, something, uh, something that took humans so many thousands of years to develop, the number system that we use now, that we've inherited from the work of a few very smart people, right? Uh, that system becomes available to everyone, right? And so six-year-olds can do things that only extreme experts used to be able to do. Um, and here's a fun puzzle. Uh, I'll put it up also at the end of the talk. This is um, uh, from a real number system in a real human language, still spoken today. So on the left, what I've given you are the names of numbers in this language. And on the right are the things that you need to figure out. Uh, so what would those number words mean? And how would you say those numbers in the language? So you can take a picture. I'll put it up again at the end of the talk. Um, it's a fun puzzle. You might want a pencil um, to figure it out. And uh, you guys don't need to be told this, but you'll know if you're getting it right. You'll figure out how to check your work, right? Okay. So uh, I've talked about uh, all of these different domains where the languages we speak might shape the way we think about space, time, color, number, agency, uh, even the gender of inanimate objects. Um, and of course, in uh, real world interactions, we care a lot about what we call things. We know that we care because we argue about it a lot, right? So do we call people refugees or migrants? Uh, are people patriots or terrorists? Uh, same people can be called those. Does the US government sponsor torture or just enhanced interrogation techniques? Um, did Bill and Monica really have sex? Um, you know, these are uh, questions that end up with really serious consequences, both uh, for individuals and nationally, so cases for impeachment, and of course, life and death circumstances for some people. 
And uh, even in quite silly circumstances, people uh, invest a lot into what things are called. So here's an example from a few years ago in California. The Prune uh, Board of California asked uh, the um, FDA to allow them to change uh, the name of their product from prunes to dried plums. Now, just to be clear, prunes are a type of dried plum, right? So prunes are dried plums. Um, but they wanted to do this for a particular reason. The word prune in American English lives in a terrible linguistic neighborhood, right? So what are prunes next to? Old age, constipation, right? These are things that young Californians don't like to think about when they shop for snacks. Uh, but dried plums, well, they live in a lovely linguistic neighborhood. They have what, like dried apricots and dried kiwis and dried mangoes next to them. That's, those are all just fine. Those are things you take on, on a hike. And what they found is, uh, you know, they had to pay millions of dollars to affect this change. Uh, and what they found was that prunes, in fact, uh, don't sell as well as dried plums. Dried plums uh, do better than prunes, so this, this was a useful change for them. Uh, later, they had to uh, actually sell both prunes and dried plums because the old people wanted the prunes. Uh, the young people wanted the dried plums. Now, again, I want to come back to this question of whether language can really change thinking, whether language is really causal, and highlight the methods that we use to test that. So one way is to train people with new ways of talking in the lab. So bring people in, teach them a mini language, and see if that changes the way they think. And we find that it does. Uh, another way is to take language away from people. So if you're relying on language in the moment to do some task, even if you don't know you're doing it, if I take that ability away from you, I should see that you now do the task differently, or maybe your performance falls apart. Uh, and in fact, in many tasks, um, uh, we see that people's performance changes drastically when you take away their ability to use language. Um, another way is, of course, to test bilinguals and test them in one language or another and see if they do perform a task differently depending on what linguistic environment they're in. Uh, and very often you do see bilinguals changing uh, depending on the language they're being tested in. Okay, now very reasonably you would ask me, well, what about programming languages, Lara? Do programming languages change the way you think? Or do speakers of different languages find different styles of programming more intuitive? And the answer is, mm -hmm. I don't know. There's, no, there's really no good research on this topic, and it's uh, really surprising. Um, a colleague of mine at the University of Wisconsin has just started a project looking at programming languages. And uh, I've put up a link here. This is a little survey that he's put together asking uh, for experts like you guys uh, information about what do you feel has changed for you when you program in different paradigms or in different languages. So uh, if you go to this link or you send your students to this link, there's a little survey that you can complete. And this, uh, this will help us get started on this set of questions. Uh, give us a set of intuitions to follow and make into real experiments. So uh, it, you may find some of the questions a little simplistic for your level of expertise, but uh, you know, tolerate it, go along with it. Or tell, tell your students to, uh, to do it. Um, it, it, would, it will give us a lot of good ideas. OK. So, to start concluding, languages and cultures make us super smart, but they also reduce cognitive entropy. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, we tend to think in the grooves that languages and cultures carve for us. And even though we're able to think about things in lots and lots of different ways, so the human mind is able to create many different number systems, many different ways to think about time, we tend to only think about them in the ways that our languages and cultures have already provided for us. And once you're inside one of those grooves, inside one of those trenches, it's hard to remember to poke your head out and think, oh, how could I think about this differently? How could I imagine things differently? We get entrenched. Um, the fact that there's so many different languages, the cognitive diversity that we see around the world, is an incredible testament to the flexibility and ingenuity of the human mind. Right? So humans are able to invent not one perspective on the world, but many thousands, 7,000 languages, many thousands more spoken in the past. Um, this is a very hopeful story about the human mind. We're incredibly flexible, inventive uh, creatures, if we just remember to be that way. Um, now, of course, not every time that you change how people talk does it change the way they think, or does it have any particular effect. So uh, let me give you some examples. Um, a few years ago, the US Congress decided to rename French fries into freedom fries. Um, 
Now, uh, this was because the French didn't want to join our coalition of the willing to go into Iraq, and uh, this was the official act of Congress meant to punish them. Uh, it uh, also uh, applied to Freedom Toast, now, uh, I don't need to tell you that this had no effect whatsoever. Um, and uh, it's also not something new. So during World War I, for example, German things got renamed into Liberty something or other. Um, now, th there's a real reason that these substitutions don't work. And that is, in natural language, if two words are substitutable for one another, usually it's because they're synonyms. The more easily you can use uh, two different words in the same context, the closer they are in meaning. So postman and mailman can be used in just about all the same contexts, and so we say they're synonyms. Um, so that's the logical basis of the substitution here. So French fries become freedom fries, and you have freedom toast, and freedom poodles, and freedom kissing, and freedom manicures. But then what should we call France? Uh, freedom land, uh, and what should we call French? The language of freedom? Uh, if you follow the logic of the substitution, it's actually exactly the opposite of the intent, right? The intent is to say that France is somehow antithetical to freedom, but in fact, instead, you're equating them because you're saying these are substitutable things. So I would argue that um, if Americans really want to annoy the French, uh, and we understand how language and thought relate to one another, then um, take the things that the French hate and call them French. So uh, ketchup will be French sauce. <laughs> McDonald's will be French cafe. Manami will be French food. Disneyland will be France. Uh, Americans will be called French people. The English language will be called French. And so on. Thank you very much. Uh, and here are your two homework assignments uh, in case you want to take a picture and help us out. Thank you.